Good morning and welcome to White Bear Unitarian Universalist Church. We are delighted to have you here, both, in, both those in this space and those attending virtually. It is good to be get together a community of youth, adults, and children sharing the values of courage, reverence, and compassion. I am Annie Vale, she, her, a member of our board of directors. Whoever and wherever you are, you're warmly invited to join us for our social hour, either on Zoom or in the social hall, beginning at 10.05. It's a 20-minute session of sharing in randomized small groups and is designed to provide a deep and intentional welcome to all. We've heard from many of you how important this time has been to connect and to meet new people. If you prefer an informal time of mingling, feel free to do so in the Emerson alcove. Uh, now I see a little notation at 11 a.m. only. So uh, after the service, families can pick up. Oh, I'm sorry. There will be. I, there will be. You can go to the Emerson alcove. <laughs> and now moving on to the next paragraph. If you have a request for today's meditation, please place it in the Zoom chat box or in the prayer bowl. Uh, if you're new today, please fill out a guest card. You can find the link in the chat box or the card at the Welcome Center. 
And please be sure to sign up to be part of our e-news mailing list where you'll learn about everything happening here at WBUUC. In addition to myself, service participants today include Reverend Roger, Reverend Sarah, Amy Peterson Derrick, and Owen Dam, with behind the scenes support from Aaron Scott and Amy Peterson Derrick. Music today is provided by Laura Stone Girage, Becky Panch, and Harmonia. A special thanks to Aaron and Harmonia for making a stellar recording for today's service. You may have noticed that Reverend Roger uh, wasn't here to greet you at the door this morning. Don't worry, he is here uh, with us virtually. And he's going to be preaching via video today. So please feel free to move to get a better view of the screens if you're here in the sanctuary. Now, a message about our annual pledge campaign. We joined the church during the pandemic and during the transition to a new senior pastor. We learned about the history of the church from Reverend Jack during the membership classes, and he helped us feel more a part of the congregation. We also joined a new member theme circle and have already found connections with new members who we look forward to meeting in person sometime soon. We both look forward so much to the Sunday services, whether on Zoom or in person, and we appreciate the ministry of Reverend Roger. He has made us feel welcome, and he also challenges us. Last year, I believe that I said that my reason for pledging was rooted in my history of learning how to think about the world through our church. This year, while I still feel comfortable saying those things, I feel immensely grateful that the church has taught me how to live these thoughts, um, how to show up in community, how to expand my de definition of love through my actions, how to have an impact, and how to get through two years of a global pandemic and still and still have hope. So please join me in thinking, in living, and in pledging to a space that shows us how to do both. Once a year in March, we encourage you to try your best to predict your gift to the church in the next fiscal year. This campaign is crucial so that our board can present a right-sized budget to help us continue to sustain our spiritual community that is so important to so many of us. When you make a financial pledge, it's making a pledge of confidence in this church, in these people. As of Friday afternoon, we are at 59% of our pledge goal with 182 households pledging $544,232. 54% of those households are increasing their pledge from last year. If you haven't done so yet, consider how this community supports you and consider how you can support this community in 2022-2023. If you are able, I hope that you will find a way to increase your pledge from last year. But even if your pledge is zero, please return a pledge card and please do it soon so we can save you a pesky phone call. You can pledge online or find a pledge card in the lobby right, and put it right in the box. And if you have any questions about the pledge drive or any other things for next year, a member of our governing board will be there available for conversation at that table right out that door after the service. Welcome to our church. Together we grow our souls and serve the world in love.
Come in. Come into this place which we make holy by our presence. Come in with all your vulnerabilities and strengths, fears and anxieties, loves and hopes. For here you need not hide, nor pretend, nor be anything other than who you are and who you are called to be. Come into this place where we are touched, where we can touch and be touched, heal and be healed, forgive and be forgiven. Come into this place where the ordinary is sanctified, the human is celebrated, the compassionate is expected. Come into this place. Together we make it a holy place and welcome. Before we move on, I just want to acknowledge there's a very loud buzz. We know it's happening. We don't know why, so can't fix it. Hopefully it will pass soon and you will continue enjoying the service with Owen Dam lighting our chalice. In the summer, I work as a lifeguard at a YMCA day camp. My first time guarding, I was extremely anxious. I was so worried about accidentally letting a camper drown that I was covering both my zone and the zones of my fellow guards. This inadvertently created a more dangerous environment as I was not completely focused on my zone. My boss noticed this and pulled me aside to inform me that I needed to trust my fellow guards and only focus on my zone. This was a major stress reliever and made it feel like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. It turns out only having to cover one area is a lot less stressful than having to cover the entire waterfront. We are lighting this chalice today for putting trust in others, because who knows, it could make your day significantly less stressful. Please join me in our opening words. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. And now we will rise in body and spirit to sing our opening hymn, I Know This Rose Will Open number 396 in Singing the Living Tradition. We'll sing it through three times. And if you're in this space with us, sing quietly behind your mask. If you're at home, feel free to sing out. Rise and body your spirit. So this morning, I brought with me once again another show and tell, because sometimes objects help us tell a story much better than words alone. Today I brought with me a chalice, this chalice. This chalice isn't really anything special. It is one of many, many chalices that have been assembled and painted over the years as my work as a religious educator. It belonged to, I don't even remember what grade class years ago. If you're close enough to see this chalice, you might notice 
something a little odd about this particular chalice. It has visible cracks filled with bubbles of hardened glue. It even has a few missing pieces, a few holes in it. And there is a simple explanation as to why this chalice is this way, and that is that sometimes I'm a little clumsy. <laughs> we all are sometimes, right? Sometimes when we are moving too fast or not paying attention or have our priorities a little out of sorts, or even when we are being so, so very careful or for no discernible reason at all, things happen. Breakable things get dropped. Breakable chalices get dropped. And I might not be sharing anything with you that you don't already know, but what, let me tell you that when breakable things, breakable chalices get dropped, they tend to break in many, many pieces. Sometimes when breakable things break, it can be really sad. It can feel like nothing will ever be the same again, or that you really let other people down. Knowing things are going to change can be really sad and scary. And this is true of chalices and other breakable things too. Maybe you've experienced this. Sometimes I have found that when breakable things break, it can be tempting to try to hide it away or hold it and fix it all alone, trying to mend what is broken back together by yourself, piece by little, little, little piece. It can be even more healing, I found, and joyful and important to not do this task alone. Fortunately, this particular chalice was not mended alone. I found I could not do that alone. I'm not very good at puzzles, it turns out. But I did this together with friends. And it is such a joy and a gift to be surrounded by friends who, having witnessed your sadness, jumped right in, offered kind words and relatable stories, and brought some reliable glue. This chalice is still a little bit like the chalice it was before it was broken. It still holds a, a candle. It can still help create sacred spaces when lit, but it is changed, and that is okay. You can see the lines where it had shattered. You can see the missing pieces. And if this chalice were to tell a story, its story would now be a little bit different than the story it would have told before it shattered. The story it might tell now might be about paying careful attention, a little bit about sadness and frustration and disappointment, but also about the many hands that have touched it, about the trusting community that helped to hold the sadness, frustration, and disappointment and helped bring the broken pieces together. The story would be a reminder about remaining open to the new shapes and possibilities that sometimes emerge out of heartbreak and to look for beauty in the cracks. Most importantly, the story would remind us that as Mr. Rogers reminded us, we are always surrounded by helpers, even when we feel hopeless. Join me in the spirit of prayer or meditation. Find a comfortable place for your body, allowing yourself a moment of restful relaxation. As a community, we are gathered here, about 30, 35 people in this room. And let's see how many are online. 67 families online. We are in this community gathered in compassion and care, in celebration and joy, and gathered to hold one another in our struggles and in our celebrations. Take a moment in this silence to hold in your mind the planet 
and all of its people, sending loving care to all of those who are suffering, particularly the people of the Ukraine and the people, the regular people of Russia who are against the war they've been forced into. Bring to mind those in our nation who are striving to maintain our democracy, particularly our new Supreme Court nominee. Bring to mind those in our state, our city, our neighbors and friends. Bring to mind these members of our community. Ken Harris will be having eye surgery this Friday. Judy Ottman was honored in a national newsletter for her um, place of residence uh, for Women's History Month. Robin Lawler and family as her father Bob Lawler passed away on March 20th from Alzheimer's. And bring to mind your people who are our, also our people and hold them too. Say their names aloud into this space so that we may share in holding them with you. We hold them all in love. Your gifts to this congregation are many and varied, including giving your time and talents. Today we ask for a financial gift to help sustain the work of this congregation as together we grow our souls and serve the world. As always, you can donate in three ways. Our WBUUC webpage, send a check, or leave a check in the locked box outside the front office, or use the text to give option. Thank you for your generosity and your faith in this life we live together. Be like the bird that, pausing in the flight, a world on falls to slight, fears and give way.
Our first reading this morning is from Rumi. You were born with potential. You were born with goodness and trust. You were born with ideals and dreams. You were born with greatness. You were born with wings. You are not meant for crawling, so don't. You have wings. Learn to use them and fly. Our second reading is The Edge of Doubt by Albert Hofstickler. There's always that edge of doubt. Trust it. That's where the new things come from. If you can't live with it, get out. Because when it's gone, you're on automatic, repeating something you've learned. Let your prayer be, save me from that tempting certainty that leads me back from the edge, that dark edge where the first light breaks.
My heart is full of gratitude today. Gratitude that my second grandchild, Cedar Adele, was born this past Wednesday. Gratitude that Cedar and her mom are doing well. Gratitude that my wife and I got to be part of the big moment by caring for our three-year-old granddaughter, Cedar's big sister, Holiday. And gratitude to my colleagues here at White Bear UU Church who have made it possible for me to work remotely so I could be part of this event in my daughter's family's life. My plan was to be back in Matamidai to record this service, uh, actually not to record, to be there in person, but Cedar was not in a hurry to come into this world and arrived almost a week later than expected. So I am pre-recording this sermon in the UU Church of Columbus, Indiana, a church that, as you may notice by the backdrop, is shared with a Jewish synagogue. And um, I am grateful, as always, for Aaron Scott's brilliant help in making this happen. I will be in the Zoom room with those of you who are watching virtually, and will lead the Cyber Social Hour after the service. A column I read a long time ago in the Chicago Tribune has stayed with me. It was written by the Unitarian Universalist minister of Forest Church. I'm sure I have a yellowing copy of it somewhere. And more importantly, it's inscribed in my heart. The piece resonated with me, resonated with me when I read it. It resonates now. Church observed in this column that there are always trap doors beneath us wandering through life and suddenly a trap door opens, an auto accident, an aneurysm, late stage cancer, and we're gone. The trap door sprang on the early side for Forrest Church himself when he died at the age of 61 of esophageal cancer. My family of origin seems hardwired to be hyper aware of the presence, the omnipresence of trap doors. My grandfather faithfully checked for fire exits in public places and rehearsed the evacuation route with my dad and his siblings. I suppose that wasn't as, dad, as bad for my dad as a friend of mine whose dad made him duck down beneath his seat during every pitch at a professional baseball game. My career choice, and especially doing chaplaincy training in a hospital on the south side of Chicago that was also a trauma center, did not help mute this hyper-awareness of trap doors. I saw a lot of those in the hospital. So you mix in my experiences of ministry with this hyper-awareness of trap doors and additional family traits of anxiety and a tendency to awfulize and you've got a pretty potent recipe for a lack of trust in life. The problem with trapdoors is that they actually are there wherever we are. I mean, I didn't make up the hard stuff that I saw on the south side of Chicago Hospital. Children as well as adults are occasionally injured by foul balls at baseball games. My friend's dad's caution, while overstated, was not completely without cause. I have a niece with metastatic breast cancer that will eventually kill her. I know someone whose son was killed by a stray lightning strike. I had a nephew who died just hours before he was born. I have a friend whose sister died in childbirth. So I can't deny these last two things were on my mind and heart on Wednesday when my daughter went to the hospital to have her baby. Bad stuff does happen. We all know this. Of course, it doesn't happen all the time. Getting hit by lightning is exceedingly rare, but trapdoors are going to open under us or someone we love sooner or later. And I'm mindful that we are lucky to live where we do. We don't have the misfortune of living in terror in Aleppo or Kiev or Kabul and way too many other places on the earth. Most of the demographic of this church doesn't have to worry uh, much about loved ones being killed by police. But still bad stuff happens, it touches all of us. And so how do we deal with this fact? How do we deal with knowing that there are trap doors beneath us? Answering this is an essential challenge in living a spiritual life. 
It feels like trust, a subset of our focus this month on faith, is part of spiritually figuring out how to live with the presence of trapdoors. And I'll be honest, I struggle with trust. Not so much trust of other people. I find it pretty easy to trust my spouse, loved ones, and communities I'm part of. My trust problem instead is focused on trusting life, the future, and at times myself. And I wonder if some of you also struggle with trust. At the end of last year, a friend of mine told me how she had focused her spiritual life in 2021 on a particular word. She picked a word that challenged and stretched and deepened her. She decided that a group offering mutual support and accountability would allow her to even go deeper into the, in this practice in 2022. And so she invited me and a couple other friends to join the group. Intrigued, I said yes to her invitation. So step one for each of us in January was to pick a focal point word for 2022. And I bet you can guess the word that popped into my head first, which was trust. And that word would not let go enough for me to even think of an alternative, even though I really didn't want to spend a year thinking about trust. So I've been pondering over these past three months what might help me cultivate trust. Maybe the place to start is what doesn't help, which for me at least, it doesn't help to pretend that everything will always end well. That factually is not true. There's nothing that any of us can do, no prayers, no chants, no rituals, no magic potions, nothing that will absolutely ensure that everything always ends up well. So instead, I'm trying to cultivate trust that whatever happens, I will in some sense be okay. I'll have what I need, emotionally, spiritually, support of community of loved ones, family and friends, to deal with whatever comes my way. I try to, be, I try to cultivate trust that I will survive bad things that don't kill me, that I can learn something. And with the support of community, I can figure out how best to navigate whatever comes. Making the best of difficult times, leaning on the love and support of loved ones, doing the best I can with whatever challenge I'm facing, I am striving to trust that this is going to be sufficient. It's going to be enough, even if the worst trapdoors spring open. Now, there's no shortage of role models for making the best of difficult times. In her article, Black Women and the Sacred, with Lemonade, Beyonce takes us to church. Yolanda Pierce writes about the resilience of Black women in the face of slavery, segregation, domestic and police violence, and so many other manifestations of racism and sexism. Commenting on Beyonce's visual album, Lemonade, Pierce suggests that the watery image in Lemonade is about barely keeping one's head above water after betrayal, heartbreak, and pain. To make lemonade out of lemons is code for powerful spiritual practice in the hands of women. Since the beginning of chattel slavery in this country, black women have been magically making something from nothing, conjuring up lives for themselves and their families with nothing but crumbs, dust, and ashes. Beyonce focuses some of lemonade on the resilience exemplified by Sabrina Fulton, Gwen Carr, and Leslie McSpadden, the mothers respectively of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, and Michael Brown. Beyonce ties them to the legacy of black women throughout American history who in the face of oppression have practiced the revolutionary power of self-love, women who have believed they were made in the image of the divine women who trusted that within themselves and their communities lay the power to be okay in some fundamental way that the oppressors could never touch. These generations of powerful Black women developed a trust in themselves and in their boundless power to make lemonade out of lemons. I picture the long lineage of powerful Black women 
from Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth to Rosa Parks and Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, embodying lines from the poem, the Rumi poem that we heard embodying these lines in the face of oppression and doubters. You were born with potential. You were born with goodness and trust. You were born with ideals and dreams. You were born with greatness. Greatness. You were born with wings. In the face of so many hurdles and in spite of so many people telling them all they could do was crawl, these women taught themselves to fly. With so many privileges and so many fewer hurdles, surely I could develop enough trust to try to fly in my life. And here's where a lack of trust in life and in my ability to handle life's lemons makes a palpable difference. My lack of trust causes me to play it safe. I don't trust that I was born with wings. I get stuck in ruts of caution and timidity. The familiar is easy, so I stick to it. I go into automatic and I don't stray near the edge of doubt. Ironically, in doing so, I don't eliminate all or even most of the trap doors beneath me. Even if I somehow engineered a bubble, I wouldn't be able to get rid of all of the trap doors. And so in this year of thinking about trust, I'm gonna meditate deeply on the prayer that was in the second reading today. Save me from that tempting certainty that leads me back from the edge, that dark edge where the first light breaks. Save me from that tempting certainty that leads me back from the edge, that dark edge where the first light breaks. Forest Church ended that long ago column with a story about walking along with his son one day. His son is nearly hit by a car in an intersection. On the next block, his son resumes a passionate activity of his as if nothing at all had happened. He jumps up to touch the leaves on trees hanging over the sidewalk. Maybe this is the lesson of trap doors. Live boldly despite their presence. Jump up to touch the leaves anyway. Give an extra hug to that beautiful new baby and her mother who just made it through a valley where the shadow of death was more palpably present. Trusting more in life and getting near the edge doesn't mean that I need to go skydiving. That is not happening. But it does impact how I live my life in big, but especially in small ways. One more piece of wisdom that I found in these months of contemplating trust, a piece of wisdom that I'm trying to let guide me. This one comes from Parker Palmer. The way will open, proceed as the way opens. The way will open, proceed as the way opens. No matter what happens in our lives, trust that a way will open and proceed. I invite you now to, in the room, rise in body or in spirit and join in singing quietly our closing hymn number 1008, When Our Heart Is In A Holy Place. And those of you, of you at home, I invite to join me in singing really loudly.
Join me in the closing words. May peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our will and love of truth forever guide us. <laughs>